it's a learned thing. Like it's not like we just were raised and we just knew how to do it. You learn it and your brain takes in how you first receive it and how you first experience it. Yes. So you had a good setup to know, okay, this is something, it's not a shameful thing. So I think that's That's a a helpful conversation to even when you first opened it, we are like, I hope you don't flip it off. Some of us are just like naturally like, oh, not my uh-huh, subject. I'm uh-huh. done. Because of those triggers that we have because of our childhood. So I think it raises your empathy for yourself when you look at the home you had. And then you look now at the home you have. And then you can desire and figure out what's the home you want to create. Hi, I'm Havila. Welcome to Havila's podcast. And today we are continuing our series on relationships. We're talking about, well, last week we talked about high functioning couples, those that have a lot going on and how to navigate pioneering in your coupling. And this week we're going to talk about sex and intimacy in in, as couples. And I know that there's a lot of things that you could be thinking about when I say this. And I really hope that you, first of all, don't, don't flip this off because I really don't want you to think, oh, here we go again, or I'm good. It doesn't matter because we're really going to have a good conversation around really how the church sees it, how we see as women, and then ways to help um, us live in a healthy sexual environment as God created. And then also I want to say for those of you that maybe aren't married and you're like, "Uh uh-oh, why are we talking about this? There were so many things I wish somebody had told me before I got married that after I got married, I had to work out and it felt way more high stakes than it did being able to just build the story where I was. So Today, we're going to have a great conversation. We have obviously one of our favorites at Truth to Table, my close friend and your friend, really, if you've been around me for a little bit, Caitlin Zick is with me today. And I'm so glad you're here. Me too. (laughs) This is my favorite subject. I know. In fact, we even prepping for this podcast, it was like, we could go here and here and here. Uh, But for those of you that are just tuning in and you may not know Caitlin, she's a mom of four four kids. She's married to Cole Zick. They are pastors of a incredible church called Risen King. She also helps me direct and lead the Truth Academy community. And she's just an all around amazing woman. She is one of those women that you could talk about anything, whether it's, are these the right shoes to wear? I'll send her (laughs) pictures of my outfits when I go to speak and say, does this work? Or we could talk about something culturally. We we could talk about something about conviction. I mean, she's just that kind of woman that you can talk about all kinds of things and you know you're going to get the real deal. So I cannot think of a better person to have this conversation with than Caitlin. So thanks for being here. Yes. Thanks for having me. If you're a mom listening with little ears, you might want to put your earbuds in. Yes. (laughs) Very true. Because we're not holding back. Nope. And we, again, I don't like to just say it to say it. Like I know there's shock value out there, but then there's other things where people talk in code and you never really feel known. Yes. And so I hope that this is a, this is a conversation for women Mm -hmm. and for couples and it's a conversation for adults. Yes. Love it. hundred percent. I think it's not talked about probably often enough in the church and it's something that we all are impacted by in one way or another. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I have four, well, four teens and tweens in my house. So I'm thinking about the messaging yeah. and, and all the things that are coming at them. I was thinking about myself at that age. You know, there's a lot going on, but I want to talk today a little bit about sex and intimacy, some of the misconceptions. Yes. You know, when I got married, I, amazingly enough, my parents had had some very, um, they were very honest about their stories. So my mom had been married before, lost her husband in a plane accident, a plane crash. My dad had been in multiple relationships and had a couple abortions before he met my mom and they got saved and got together. So I grew up in a home that was very honest about sex. Mm-hmm. And um, I think they they weren't descriptive in the sense that it was like, oh gosh, But they were really honest about the pain and regret and what can happen. Mm. And it really allowed me, I think, to lean into them, not just as a authoritative idea, but actually like a human being that says, please don't Mm. do what I did. And I think we can do that as parents and not be ashamed of that to say, you're allowed to live a a different story. um, And I want you to, and my story may not be that story, but that doesn't lose the power of saying, I want you to have a different story. Um, So I did that. And then I got married to my husband and we started this whole sex life that 
quite honestly, we were in the generation of I kiss dating goodbye and we had a purity ring. And then it was like from one day to don't talk about it, look at it, think about it to now you can do everything. It was like, it was, the switch was very fast and I got pregnant three months later. So apparently I was doing it right. <laughs> you figured um, it out. <laughs> and I, and I have a great sex life, which sounds kind of weird, but honestly I do. And I think it's because of some of the holistic ideas that we're going to talk about today yes, and yeah. some of the things that we have to figure out. So Tell us a little bit why you love this topic. Yes, definitely. You do. Well, first of all, just hearing your parents and how they raised you, obviously they had already experienced a level of freedom in their life to be able to talk about it. So I think that's the number one thing, which actually, shout out to Havila herself. Uh, my favorite book on sexuality is yours, The Naked Truth About Sexuality. Oh, thank you. So if you need that, go get it. Um, but you talk about the environments we're raised in. And so I think that can honestly be a make it or break it for you. So it's that intentional home that actually talks about it, has healthy conversations, a silent environment where you're like left to figure it out on your own because the most important people in your life aren't talking to you about it. The conflicted home where you're like, it's no, no, no. Any curiosity is shamed and blamed. And then you just think you're perverted because you had a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the saturated home where your home is just saturated, where we're all mammals. Let's just do it. Like they do on the yes, discovery yes. channel, all of the shows, maybe you're given porn as a kid or given condoms on your 16th birthday. There's so many different environments. Yeah. So I think first we have to look at how did we learn it and understand that it is a learned it's a learned thing. Like it's not like we just were raised and we just knew how to do it. You learn it and your brain takes in how you first receive it and how you first experience it. Yes. So you had a good setup to know, okay, this is something, it's not a shameful thing. So I think that's, that's a, a helpful point. conversation to, even when you first opened it, we're like, I hope you don't flip it off. Some of us are just like naturally like, Oh, not my uh -huh. subject. I'm uh -huh. done because of those triggers that we have because of our childhood. So I think it raises your empathy for yourself when you look at the home you had and then you look now at the home you have and then you can desire and figure out what's the home you want to create. So well that's <laughs> something that I'm so passionate about raising four kids. And my story was very different. Um, I was not raised. I read I Kissed Dating Goodbye after I got saved. <laughs> um, but I got saved uh, far after many mistakes were made. And so I was raised in our hypersexualized culture. Um, and I... I, once I got saved, I just remember thinking if I knew there was another way I would have taken it. Mm -hmm. Like I almost felt this like righteous anger of like, if someone would have told me I would have gone that way. And so I, wow. I share and have shared with through moral revolution all over podcasts and the internet. Uh, my story is everywhere. One day my teenagers are going to figure that out and they're gonna be like, Oh gosh. <laughs> um, but share it all over the world because I'm like, if somebody would have told me I would have done a different, I would have gone that path. Um, but in this hypersexualized culture as a young girl, my objective was how to be powerful and popular. And that meant chasing guys or letting guys chase you. And so the number of guys that I had hooked up with is countless. So many drunken nights and parties. And um, there was a point where it almost became a competition for me and my friends. We literally had a notebook where you would write down the number of guys you hooked up with. Yep. And the longer the list, you thought you were winning, but not knowing what we were losing the whole time. And so, wow, the, wow. I just want to say that's <laughs> so interesting. I thought we were winning, but we didn't know what we were losing. Yeah. Like that's because right now I think kids call it body count. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I mean, it's even more direct than yeah, it was probably, probably right. back then. Oh yeah. Yeah. I had no idea what I was losing. No, no. I found my worth in being wanted. Yeah. That was the foundation of my worthiness was in being wanted by guys. So the fact that my pager, which if you're younger, <laughs> this should be like, what? Uh, my pager was blowing up with booty calls. I thought I was the best. Like, I thought I was sure. winning. I thought I was achieving everything in life that it was, you know, mapped out for me. Um, and so I didn't find out till years later. I got saved and then basically went to the Christian bookstore, which I wish those still existed. <laughs> and I read every Christian dating book I could because I'm like, I need to figure wow. out what God says about this topic. I have no idea. So I read, I kissed dating goodbye and I gave dating a chance and like just every book po <laughs> possible on like purity and sexuality and really started to form my own truth and ask God to heal me and forgive me. And I experienced a lot of breakthrough, but after checking all of the boxes and then getting married, uh, still experiencing really negative uh, impact from my past. Yeah. I was like, what the heck? This is not what, like, I, I put it all on the cross. I've confessed it. Like, what else is there to get some breakthrough in this area? Yeah, which I think a lot of people find themselves like, yes. okay, I, I did the, I married the Christian guy. Mm -hmm. I did the thing, right? I, I asked forgiveness, but we can't change the body keeps the score. Yes. And we can't change sometimes what the story that we even don't, We've, we've confessed, yes. but I think it's very, very real. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I look at it even as, you know, they talk about the gir good girl complex of the girl that wasn't allowed to talk about sex. And then the next day they can have sex and they literally can't even, even 
be in that atmosphere right. and feel sexually turned on because they weren't allowed to. So like you said, there's trauma yes. from the stories 100%. and all of that. So you get into marriage, yep. you marry this great guy, Cole, yes. which we all love Cole. <laughs> yep. And you, did you think, okay, it's all going to be fine? <laughs> yeah. So the quickest way to sum that up is this promiscuous party girl married the poster boy for purity. <laughs> okay. He literally in high school had a below the belt rule. He would not date or do anything with a girl that had done something below the belt. <laughs> Him and his friend. That <laughs> was their totally role. Yeah, that was yes, their role. So the, the first time he met me too, which I'm a Christian at this point, but knew I like had what I thought was a modest outfit on. And if he was here, he would literally tell you like he didn't even second look at me because he's like, that's not my kind of girl because he <laughs> thought I was so immodest. I'm like, what? So yeah, we're complete <laughs> opposites. Get married. Um, I obviously at by the point that by the time we got married, I had experienced so much breakthrough, redemption, forgiveness, saw myself differently. He helped me. I remember giving him this cheesy gift when we were dating of like, my name means pure because I found it at the Christian bookstore. Uh, and I was like, <laughs> my name means pure and you helped me see myself that way. Like he was a huge part of my healing and redemption story. Um, at one point when he felt this, like, I need to know every detail of the people you've been with and we meet, we're going to meet up to do it. The Lord told him, I can't, I can't have you ask that. And he's like, what do you wow. mean? He's like, you can't ask that and be a preacher. Cause that's all my husband wanted to be since he was like four or five. Yeah. And he's like, what do you mean, God? I don't get it. Like, I, I just, it's irritating me. I got to know. And he's like, I can't have you preaching about grace if you don't know how to live it out. And he's like, wow. her sin as as far as the East is from the West. She is white as snow. I have dealt with it. She has confessed. She's living in freedom. That's the end of the story. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So we experience so much beautiful, like with mentors and coaches and counselors in our life, like really like we were walked to a really healthy place. But I think that I didn't have somebody telling me like all I knew. So my sexual history actually was all oral sex and yes. everything else. So no like actual vaginal intercourse. So I going into the honeymoon, I still am like, I don't know what I'm doing when it comes yeah. to this. All my prep was it's going to hurt the first couple of times. Then you're going to be fine and you're going to love it. That was like, uh -huh. that was everything I knew. And it was awful. Our honeymoon was terrible. <laughs> oh, no. um, which there's so many layers to my story, but I like to address it at least quickly because I do think there's silence around this factor. I actually had a physical issue, um, but yeah. they didn't discover it. So, I mean, there's so many, there's so much more information out there about this now, but I had extra tissue, yes. but it wasn't discovered till I was delivering my first baby. So I had gone to the doctor and like something's wrong with me. Like it was extremely painful for four years. Yes. I would have to like hide my face in the pillow in excruciating pain. Cause I'm like, I know we need to get there, but this is so hard. Um, yeah. so finally they removed the extra tissue, um, upon delivering my son. And so for the first time I was having intercourse without pain. Yeah. So then we're like, awesome. Like this is what we've been waiting for. Like, Ooh, let's try it. And so we'd be, it was finally pain free. And I'm thinking, why isn't it not good? Yeah. But it wasn't that it wasn't just good yet. I wasn't experiencing a fulfillment or pleasure, but my body would just tense up at the thought. Like yes. I'd be in the kitchen washing dishes. He'd come to gently touch me and my whole body tenses up. So that's what finally dig, like led us to dig in, find a professional Christian sex therapist and counselor. Um, and that's when she di diagnosed me with PTSD. And she, mm. a, she actually just gave a lot of language to what I thought was just normal party girl. Yeah. Um, or even sometimes the enemy gets us to, I feel like stay silent. Cause I just would compare my story to others. Like, well, I could have screamed. No, I yes. could have ran away. I yes. could have kept saying no for, I said no once for 45 minutes in a backseat and it was super traumatic. And I finally gave in so that I could escape like these moments that you're like, but it, it still was on me. And, um, she was like, you know, different situations with an older man when I was 16, she's like, yeah. you were molested. Like yeah. you experienced trauma. Like this was not okay. Yeah. And so some of the things that you had suppressed, some that you had made excuses for, but she immediately diagnosed me and then said, I need you guys to have a reset and I need you to go some time while we work through this with just no physical intimacy whatsoever. Wow. So I we just want to go back to it yeah. because that is, it's very profound when somebody validates your story, mm -hmm. goes back and actually says that was wrong. And you see yourself as a child, not just a participating yes. party. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that um, okay, it's a physical thing. That's probably what it is. It'll be fine after. And then PTSD probably wasn't talked about that often. No, I had um, never heard of yeah. it besides like veterans at that point yes. when I had gone in. Yeah. And that's what, and, and they actually have been d done some research recently where they are talking about this generation having a lot of PTSD from dating. Mm. And, um, because it's a get together, breakup, get together, yes. breakup that we literally have trauma from being broken up with and being committed. I love you. I'm with you. And then gone that by the time we get in marriage, we have a lot of trauma and we can't put it on something other than, yeah, I don't know why I 
I don't feel safe. I don't know why I'm, I'm half in, half out. And so I do think that there's a part 100%. of that. So you meet with her. She diagnoses you with PTSD. Did that, had that feel at that moment when she said it? It felt overwhelming. It felt relieving. So I was like, okay, there, it's almost like when the doctor found the extra tissue and I was like, there is something wrong with me. Like I yeah. felt relieved, like, good, there's a solution on the other side of this. So I think I felt that same sense of relief of good, there's something wrong with me. So there must be a solution on the other side, but definitely had the lies of like, you're just so messed up. She suggested yeah. EMDR, which is again, super common. A lot of listeners probably are familiar with these things. Yeah. I had never heard any of it before. So I was like, I need some special thing because I'm so, you know, so there were definitely <laughs> those accusations of just like, this is going to be long and hard. And, um, but I was really, I, I hated going like, I, it's like the gym, like you don't want to go and get ready, but once you're <laughs> there, true. you're like, this is so good. And when you leave, you're like, I'm so glad I went. So I definitely had that tension every, every week when I was going and showing up to do this hard work, it was really hard work to dig in. Um, something you said was, you know, seeing yourself as a child, it was so important. I remember mm. she had me picture a 13 year old girl that I currently knew. Mm. And she said, what would you do if she was in that situation? What would you expect of her? Like what, you know, what would have happened if she said no and she ran out of the movie theater? And so that helped humanize it and yeah. increase empathy. And obviously she walked Jesus into the room with me. She did a lot of inner healing. So it was beautiful. It was just really hard. Really hard. Yeah. Hard work. Yeah. Soul work. And some things come up that you're like, I didn't even know that I was out of self-protection, probably completely forgetting and living in denial about moments that I had forgotten about sure. that even happened. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think anyone who's gone through those kind of situations, even in childhood, but yeah, you, you until you have permission to go, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And then it is, it's work. It's yeah. so much work. Like I could just imagine you, you're a mom, you're a wife, you've got, I mean, I just could imagine you going to that office and going, okay, we're going to unpack. Yeah. And you didn't have to, you didn't have to, but there was something in you that went, this, I want, I want a healthy sex life. Totally. Like, I think that there are a lot of women that can just go, I'm out. I, you know what? It is what it is. As long as he's pleased, I'm yeah. good. Mm -hmm. And they're missing so yeah. much. And so I love the fact that you still fought for that little girl that deserved to have that. Yeah. So what did it look like when she said, I want you guys to take a break, reset? Um, it felt easy in the moment. Cole, if he was here, would like laugh and just say like, we weren't having much sex anyway. So great. If this is going to help <laughs> us have more awesome. You know, I think part of his story and his experience on his side was just thinking, oh, wow, well, the Lord must have kept me and protected me. So I'm not addicted to sex. Like he has never seen pornography. Yeah. He's never masturbated. So he's like, I can do this like once a month thing. If, if this is my lot in life with my wife. Wow. Um, so he he's was superhuman. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You're like, okay. So, but, but also settling. So honestly, what was my resolution that kept me going was I refused to settle for less than God's best in my yeah. sex life. And then for me, when I know it's because of something the enemy is trying to do, like that fires me up even more. So yeah. he's going to lose because I'm pissed off at him now. So the <laughs> fact that the enemy would use my past to steal from my present and my future, and then honestly, a family line of what my daughter's yes. going to experience. So nothing fires me up more. So that is what kept me going. And I think that's where women that are listening that might, I, because I've gotten to share my story so much, I know so many women have similar stories yeah. and I know it's hard to press through and to work at it, but it's so, so, so important. You, your marriage deserves it. Your future line deserves it. It's sometimes can feel like a permission slip to settle for less. Cause you're like, nobody understands how hard this is or the, the painful parts, all of the different things, but it's so worth it. And we literally have the best sex life. I honestly sometimes can't believe it. I'm like, wow, like I have pain-free sex with pleasure every time. It was 11 years in, which is a whole nother lie that we could do another podcast on. Um, they say the typical marriage doesn't get really good uh, fulfilling sex for both parties till year 12. And most divorce happens at year seven. Wow. So it's like some, for wow. some of us, it's taking that extra time to figure it out and get there. Uh, but it was year 11 for me. And now every single time um, I experience pleasure, like I just I can't even believe that's my story. It did take work. It took, kept showing up. There were other seasons we're sitting in yeah. living room with you guys, a small group. I'm still realizing, oh, wow, I'm still selling for less in this one area of pleasure yeah. where I don't like this certain thing because I know it's linked to my past and going after counseling again, even though you're like, oh, you know, the, like the, the drama of doing it again. <laughs> you're like, no, <laughs> didn't I graduate from this? Um, but I don't, I think sometimes it's the kindness of God that it happens in layers. Like it's the kindness of God that he's not like, get it all out now. So true. Um, and pursuing it again, instead of still letting something remain, that is not what the best for what God has for you. Yeah. I'm so proud of you. My heart's uh. just bursting. Like I'm so proud of you. So you, you take a break and you, 
disengaged for a year. Yeah. A full it year. It ended up being a year and a half. It was 18 a year months. and a half. Um, I had just had our second son. Wow. So part of it was like breastfeeding. You can't counsel. Like yes. Da, da, da. Yes. And so it was just that we were youth pastors making probably like 25000 a year. Like we right. couldn't afford it. Like we had to spread them out. So whenever I say that, I've actually had somebody say like, I told my husband, Cole could not have sex for that long. Neither can you. I'm like, whoa, this is yeah. not a prescription yeah, yeah, lady. Yeah. Like I would not wish that on anybody. Um, the, the reset was necessary, but I say you do that with a licensed professional counselor that shows, you know, like That's walks good. you through it. And then, yeah, I do think Cole's a little bit of a superhuman so that he could he manage kind. that. Super he kind. He it against yeah. you. No, the which Lord. I think, yeah, it can happen. Yeah, the Lord totally. It was a beautiful thing we were doing together. It wasn't just like, and he trusted me. He trusted me that I was doing what I needed to do for us. And I think sometimes if you, if you're in my spot and you are bitter, then you're not, you're not getting better. You're just, you're living in the victim mentality. And right. he knew I wasn't doing that. You weren't hiding. Mm -mm. And so after you look back, you started, I love the 11 year mark. Cause yeah. I agree. Like I used to think, um, and I used to tell this to, to different ones. Like it's not a sexual moment. It's sex life. Yes. And so you build your sex life. Mm -hmm. And I think for me personally, I learned that it's really about Ben and I, mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with anybody else. Yeah. The, the bedroom is sacred yeah. and what, and I, and that's why I even think it really is about being known and feeling safe and being able to go. I like that. Or I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Like those things are important. Yeah. And I think also being willing to, um, to know yourself. And I think that really happened in community for me, like mm. as we would have conversations or I'd have conversations with, and finding out that I wasn't alone or that this, Hey, this really helps or those things are really helpful. And I think sometimes we just don't talk about it yeah. and we just assume that's what it is. So I'm curious for you, how did, did you, once you went through that year and yeah. then you started to re-engage, how did you feel like you're on the other side? How did you know that you're on the other side? Yeah. So once she kind of gave us the green light, Cole so sweetly because I, I probably was been like okay green light you know I don't know and he was just like let he got us a weekend away mm. in Napa and he said but we have no like intercourse on the menu like wow. let's just go slow and enjoy what we haven't enjoyed for a long time and see what happens and so I, some of it's a blur like I don't remember all of it but he made me feel safe immediately obviously and it was just it was a slow build it was I just remember <laughs> I used to tell friends around dinner tables so 100 mm -hmm. I had groups of women that even back then I would we knew it was like cheesecake factory every year we would talk about it, it was so yeah. random but we would <laughs> have the conversations and the tips and the helpful you know just women talk too but I just remember thinking like I'm gonna get there I remember thinking I'm gonna be be creative mm. with moving. I used to be just so stiff, like yes. just practically because totally. of the pain. So you're like, okay, I can break out of that. There's no pain. And so just letting myself enjoy it. It doesn't have to feel like a checklist of I'm going to have an orgasm today. Yes. I can enjoy. And I think that discovering together is part of the gift. Obviously one of the biggest lies we were told as young people is like, you have to test drive the car before you buy it. You have to know how to do what you're doing. I'm like, no, this is one of the most beautiful things. Like right. my husband was like, where do we put our knees? Like he doesn't know. Yes. I don't know. Yes. we're figuring it out together but that's so fun so we do feel like we're like we've built this beautiful sex life like we've built this intimacy and this trust and so um I got there slowly but surely but just not having a ton of pressure for when will that happen yes I totally agree I think to the idea like um you know I you don't know yourself and so it takes a while to know who you are and mm -hmm. what you enjoy and for me personally I remember I had a friend who was happily married, um, but was really struggling in her intimacy. And she met with the sex therapist and she had said to her, you need to do the work before everything starts. Meaning what makes you feel like a woman? What mm, makes you feel yes. sexy? What makes you feel like you want, like when you were dating? And she found out that these romantic movies, her, her rom-coms were those kind of like, oh, they get me in the, I'm a woman. I'm not just the mom. I'm not just breastfeeding. Yeah. I'm not just running from here to here. And so she talked about how her therapist had told her, really start to warm up, warm yourself up. So it may not happen that night, but you're, you're getting yourself in that space. Yeah. And for me, that was revelatory. Like that idea of getting in that space of like, Hey, I know we're coming around the mountain. It's going to be, I'm going to be having sex soon. Yep. I need to get my head in that space versus mm -hmm. me being the mom, the nurse, 100%. the cook, the driver. <laughs> and then all of a sudden flip it to I'm your sex partner. Yes. It's, it's, and then, and then honestly, res, like push, like saying, no, 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 it's fine. Or just faking it rather than being like, that's not what they want either. No. Their partner, mm -hmm. they want you to show up as well. So for me, it was really intentional things like, 
treating myself like a woman, looking at things that were feminine, t- getting ready. Like yeah. I, I often found myself in yoga pants and my hair back for a week or two and really it's like, wait a minute, I need to get ready. Like I'm a woman. I actually can be feminine. I can look the way I want to look and smell the way I want to look. And that would get me ready. So good. But then also I would say, because I travel, I found that sex is so powerful. It's so stinking powerful. The mm-hmm. enemy knows it, yeah. so he counterfeits it. But for Ben and I, if we can come together sexually it be, when I get back, yeah. it's like we immediately sync up. Yeah. Like our life syncs up. Everything just, it's like we're back. And I found the enemy hated us to be sexual. But when I would get back, we'd always get in an argument. I would be tired. I'd have a headache. He would be busy. And and then I found the longer we waited to connect, the more it just felt like mm. there was this restlessness and yeah. this like this almost like the enemy was coming in. And so I intentionally, many, many years ago went, I, my, my first thing on my list, one of this one, two or three is like, we're going to have sex and I'm going to figure it, it out and yeah. I'm just going to get my head in the game and I'm going to do it not to check a box, but to intentionally say we're back together. Yeah. This is what we're doing. Yeah. And that's been really healthy for us. It's, it's been huge. helpful. Yeah. But I had to take responsibility. I had this kind of part of me that was like, you have to warm me up. You have to do all the work. You have to make me feel like that. Mm-hmm. You have to tell me all the right things and then I'll be there versus like, that's, that's not really his job yeah, fully. Yeah. You know, he can do what he does, which is he's kind and gentle and safe. And he wants me to be happy before he's happy, which are, those are good things in a, in a lover. But I think part of it is I have to take my role as a woman and say, if I feel frumpy and I feel yeah. like a man and I'm just, why would I, I can't show up like a woman if I'm treating myself like a man all the time. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, but no, that was huge so for good. me. It's so good. So some of the practical things that I found that helped me as well is realizing, because what you're talking about, what I hear and what was definitely a thing for me is how do I switch from duty to desire? Because I think as a woman, especially when you're high functioning and you have kids and you're doing all the things, you're like, it does feel like another checklist at the end of the day. Um, And so I would just encourage any women that are listening to pray about it. Like, how do I switch Mm. this duty that's on my to-do list into a desire? Lord, increase my desire. What does that look like? You gave practical ways of how I take care of myself. Getting nice panties. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And intentionally putting them on even under your yoga pants if that's your uniform of the day, your mama form. Um, but something people talk about, there's lots of talk about scheduling sex. Cole would literally just, it sounds like nails on a chalkboard. He's like, I don't want you to, Uh -uh. no, it doesn't work for us. But what I do encourage people is put a little heart emoji on your calendar. Or I always Mm. put TS think sex because the number one sexual organ is the mind. It's not anything else. It's no other organs in your body. It's your mind. There's a doctor who said 80% mental, 20% friction. Wow. So you have to figure out what gets your mind there. And what takes your mind away. And so if it's simply just a reminder on your calendar or something you write on your bathroom mirror or putting on the right underclothes that day to be able to think about it, to feel that way, to know my desire is to be with my husband that way. I have to do some setup work to make sure I get there. And one of the things that's actually, your friend that rom-coms helped her, anything like that actually really hindered me. Yeah. So I think that's because of my past, yeah. right? So if I watch, it wasn't even rom-coms. It was more like a Law & Order SVU. I grew yes. up watching it. Like yes. my kids, my parents raised me on SVU. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. You know, I could do the whole song for you. Um, but that was really, it, I worked it out with my counselor and she was like, you're seeing that and that's your body goes into the fight or flight just like it did as a young girl when you're seeing that. And it's really hard for your mind to separate what you and your husband do yeah. from those moments. Wow. So we had to cut out some of our shows and the entertainment intake and then definitely like obviously I can still watch some rom-coms but I just had to have some really hard boundaries for myself to realize if it was drawing me into something that is false and it's not what I want to experience with my husband it's such a distraction that makes me kind of disgusted by the whole act rather than yeah. thinking about my husband. Um, so if you do have a story similar to mine and you're listening, I forgot, and this is like my number one favorite book. It's an old book, but it's never irrelevant because it's about sex. It's called Intimate Issues. It was like my, I used to joke, like it's my Christian Cosmo. <laughs> and it was on my bedside. If I had it here with me today, it's like worn and torn. Uh, it's what got me through. And it's yeah. what helped me change my mind and showed me why God made sex. To be honest, at the very beginning when it was still like hard and I'm like, how are we going to do this? I literally would read it and I'd be like, I want to have sex because it's like this is what God made it for I can't wait to have it 
Um, but it talks about all things like what to do when you're a crock pot and he's a microwave. Yes. <laughs> like it, it talks about what, what to do. Like when we have little kids, it doesn't mean we have to have little sex. Like what are these practical things that's written by women for that. women? And so finding out what are the practical ways to get your mind, your largest sexual organ prepared to have a really healthy, intimate life. I love that. And I, I think it was amazing for me is because I hadn't had sex before I got married and this, you as yeah. well. I was shocked at how much all the foreplay was sex. I thought like, oh, but we're not having intercourse, <laughs> yes. you know? So like kissing and making out or touching each other, like that's, you know, that's all over there. But then sex intercourse is over here. And if I had known yeah. how powerful that was, I would have had way more boundaries around it probably. So but true. also like the idea of that, that there's like, hmm. that you need that in sex. And so if you kind of go, that's, that's not sex and this is sex, you miss that kind of warming up. And so like some of the things Ben and I've talked about is like, I just want sometimes to like, us just to cuddle and it's not going to go anywhere. And sometimes mm. I just want to kiss you and not feel like it's got to, you know, like I don't need an ending. I, some of that, my body would go into like, everything has to end with this, yeah. with sex and I'm not ready for that. So giving myself permission, A, I, I t my mental work is let him do what he's good at. Mm. You don't have to, you don't have to initiate and you don't have to get there. Let him do what he's good at and let him warm you up. And I would just tell him that I need you to warm me up. I need you to rub my back. Yes. I need you. Let's put on something nice. I need to get out of that mode. Mm -hmm. Um, or I just feel like I have to just flip a script. And if you want me here, right? Yeah. So for me, I'm like, you have to, so I would just say, can you sit with me for a minute? Let's go in the jacuzzi, like warming my body up to yeah. being separate was very, very important. And then telling my mind, um, you don't have to get there. I know that sounds funny, but yeah. like my mind, allowing my mind to not go, that's the ultimate, I have to have an orgasm right. or that's it wasn't successful. Win that's, not def that's not the win. It's not the win. The yeah. win is holding each other, mm -hmm. connecting, fighting for marriage and intimacy. That was the win. The win was we can try again tomorrow. That was the win. Yeah. And I think that took the stakes down because there's this high stakes and guys just, they orgasm every time. And so you feel like <laughs> what's going on, you know? And then also being willing to ask for what I need if I'm, I, and honestly being really honest, like sometimes it's, I need you, you're going to have to work a little bit. I'm not in the mode, yeah. but I'd like to be pleased tonight. Like I really would like, I'd like to go to bed with a happy ending as well. Yes. Or I need this to be fast. Like I don't have time and I know you want me to be in there and get in it, but like, I feel like the dude, but like, can we make this fast? Yeah. Because I would, I need to get going and I love you. So don't, don't be mad if I'm not fully there. Right. Um, and then also just for Ben and I, it's we flirting during the day, mm -hmm. sending a text, being flirty yeah. so that by the time you get there, and then I would say this, and again, anybody who's watching this or listening, if you're in pain, if you have no sex drive, if your partner has no sex drive, these are medical things. Yeah. These are not a God thing, a mental mm. thing. It's not a try harder. These are medical things. So the first thing I would say is if you're having a hard time, go to your doctor, yeah. get treatment first because I think that's really big uh yeah. even the percentage of people that are on anti-anxiety medication can hinder your ability to climax mm. so you think about the percentage of those that are listening today yeah. or watching that have are on medication that's going to hinder them from yeah. being able to get there and then also the the main thing is just understanding that it's a sex life you're you're building it yeah. so I say medical doctor there's sex therapist sometimes mm -hmm. therapy yourself yeah and sometimes I feel like women and even myself included at times was like I need him to do this rather than I'm a full human being I get to choose how I want to be touched how I want to be talked to how I want to be treated and I and that doesn't even have to do with him that's right. me how yeah. I talk to myself how I treat myself yeah. and so really nurturing me allows me to show up in an environment without tell me I'm pretty a thousand times and I still won't get naked in front of you. That, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, that totally. kind of thing. So yeah. it's very, very helpful. So I'm, I'm curious for the, for the women that are, and the guys that are watching this and they're listening to you and they're like, oh yeah. Okay. How do I, you know, I, I haven't had pleasure. I've been, and I've, I've met many women yeah. and, men, and men, not men very much, but women mostly that have said, um, men have obviously have at some point it's just not consistent but for a woman they've never had an orgasm yeah married yeah. love god did it the right way and have an orgasmed and that's a thing in their marriage it's yeah. hard what yes. what do you recommend for them i 
I don't, I wish I had a formula, right? Like, no. every, you're like, this is what it happened. And we're we, not sex therapists. No, so I want to be clear. No, are, but you should find just, one. Yes. Yeah, you should find one. You should see if it's something from your past affecting it or if it is just a body thing. Yeah, that's good. Because I think, and then it could just be mental because you haven't had one for so long, you're expecting it. So I'm like, there's so much to work through. Um, but for me, there's not a formula. It's just that I, I remember the season that I was trying without pressure. Like I was like, I get to yes. have fun. Like I get to move. I get to figure it out. I get, it didn't feel like a loss every time when I didn't like, I'm like, Oh, I still enjoyed myself and I still had fun and we feel super connected. So I'm like, if it's begrudging every time, because you're just like hoping for this end goal, then you're never going to look forward to it. You're probably never going to get it. So right. you're like, you just have to be okay with the process. Um, but I would seek help if you're like, okay, it's been a decade. You know, sometimes when people talk to me and they're like, I'm in, I've been married for two months and I'm like, it's okay. it's okay. You're going to get there. <laughs> but I would, I mean, I fight for counseling all the time. I'm just like, it helped me. It helps me in lots of different seasons. So I'm like, if I was really struggling and I'm like, I've been working at this and we can't get there, then I'd probably just go to a counselor and see. They're going to be able to help you find what the root they is. Will. If it's mental, if it's physical, if it's spiritual, if it's trauma-based, like they're going to be able to help you find the root and get to a healthy place. And you're going to be able to trust yourself more because you're like, I'm fully invested in this. That's I think right. if anything, as a female struggling with it, it can be easy to just want to like live in denial or I just remember being somewhat embarrassed like totally how did I have all this fun before yes. and now I can't do yes. anything you're like really that's my story um and there was two of us in a friend group of like 10 that couldn't get there and we were always the ones that you know they were giving us all the advice and all the things we're like it's still not working but just having to instead of feeling like a failure really accepting the process and knowing right. it's part of the discovery is part of the process and part of the gift with our husbands I totally agree this has been a great conversation yes. I, I want to just note one thing and that is I think pornography in a marriage is yeah. dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I just want to, I want to say that in terms of being warmed up or trauma, I think it's, if I think the marriage bed is sacred, yes. but to not include profane things. And I think we get stuck in a culture that's everything's accept acceptable as long as you're together. And I just want to say when it turns into a, just about an orgasm, you're missing all intimacy because yes. intimacy is about love, trust, respect, yep. no shame. It's all that, right? Yeah. So I think bringing other people in, I think pornography, I think things that can just end up tainting what intimacy really is, 100%, right? Because yes. porn is acting. Yeah. It's not real. Yes. And you can do studies on that to see that most of them, it's it's a tragic it's tragedy. Tra what it does to the brain is insane. It's insane. So we could have many, many more conversations, <laughs> yes. Kate and I, and we probably will. But today, I hope that those of you that have been watching and listening, you got something out of this. I love you, Kate, and I love her honesty. I'm sure you did too, her vulnerability. And we don't have it all figured out. We're not these girls that are like, we got this, we're good. No, it's through a journey. And we hope that we gave you courage to ask good questions to seek help if you need it, to explore your femininity or your masculinity. And most importantly, I hope we gave you courage to talk about sex because it's really part of our lives. And guess what? God made it. He's not ashamed of it. He made it. And he wants us to be having good sex. He does. Uh, but sex is not just about orgasm. It's about a relationship in the safety of a covenant. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. And uh, this whole month has been a phenomenal, it's going to be a phenomenal series. I say phenomenal because we're going to go into week three next week as we talk more in and around relationships. You guys, I love you so much. Don't forget two things. If you like this podcast or you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. Please give us some stars. Let us know that you're watching this and leave us a review. Let us know if you like these kind of topics because we'll put more content out. And also, lastly, I want you to know we are praying for you, that wherever you are in your heart, if this opened up something, God is with you right now. He's not going to leave you or abandon you. He's with you to heal, to cover you, and to help you wherever you might be. And miracles can happen. We believe it. We've seen it. So wherever you are, your past does not dictate your future. You get a new future because God has given you a full brand new future that's right ahead of you. So we love you. Kate, thanks for being thanks here. Thanks for having me. I love you. you and uh, guys, we'll see you next time. Bye.